Hello and good day to everyone. The Division of Virgin Islands Cultural Education is placing a significant amount of emphasis on topics surrounding emancipation and post emancipation in celebration of March being designated as Virgin Islands History Month through the use of the theme Emancipation Now, Understanding History, Living the Legacy, and Creating a Just Future for Aloe. This year marks the 175th anniversary of the Emancipation Revolt in the Virgin Islands that occurred in 1848. Part of this year's VI history events are conversations about our legacy after emancipation. Our hope is that educators will gain further knowledge about the correlation of current issues and historical events related to the 1848 Acts of Equity and how they have affected the lives of Virgin Islanders today. Dr. George Tyson, or Mr. Mr. Tyson, today is our presenter and he's providing an overview of the 1848 insurrection. Mr. Tyson is a historian who is largely regarded as the leading scholar on the history of the Virgin Islands. He is the former president of the Society of Virgin Islands Historians, and Mr. Tyson has also lectured at the University of the Virgin Islands and led the, as an executive director of the St. Croix Landmark Society. He has consulted for organizations such as UNESCO and the Organi Organization of American States, as well as for the Virgin Islands National Park. Park. He is currently the head of the St. Croix African Origins Project a group of Danish and American academics digitizing and analyzing historical records from the island's time under Danish sovereignties. He is a uh, published author and his uh, publications include Toussaint's L'Overture, Powder, Prophets and Privateers, a documentary history of the Virgin Islands during the era of the American Revolution, the Homestead Program of St. Croix, bondsmen and freedmen in the Danish West Indies. He is also credited with several other works, including Kamina Folk, The Slavery and Slave Life in the Danish West Indies, The Danish Slave Trade and Its Abolition, Slavery in the Danish West Indies, A Bibliography, and Maritime Maroonage from St. Croix to Puerto Rico. Mr. Tyson is also married to Camilla Marlene Jensen, and is the father of Claire Tyson and Vega Tyson and Norma, Ty and Norma Tyson. Mr. Tyson, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to share some of my points of view on the emancipation uh, with you. Let me give you a little more about my background. Um, I came to the Virgin Islands originally as a teacher, and I taught in the um, All Saints School for two years, and then later on taught at University of the Virgin Islands for two years, three years. Um, I am aware of the challenges that teachers have when it comes to dealing with information about the past in the Virgin Islands, and the challenges we have with bringing new information to the public. And part of what I've done in the last 50 years or so is try to bring not only my point of view, but others' points of view uh, into the public through publications and public, public activity. Um, I would also like to say that I am here representing my current position, which is as the historian with the State Historic Preservation Office. I am a preservationist and always have been. Uh, I do that because I believe that buildings tell stories and they are worth saving not only because they are architecturally significant, but because they are significant um, visual uh, remnants of the stories of the people who have built and inhabited them. And that informs my whole perspective on emancipation, which I'll share with you in, in this lecture. 
Um, I'm going to get start with my own point of view on emancipation, and this is, comes from reading a lot of material, primarily material that is uh, published by uh, historians who have used documentary sources uh, that are found in abundance in both the U.S. and the Danish National Archives. I believe that documentary sources are what we have to depend on for our information, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, I will start by declaring that the popular general uprising that occurred on St. Croix and led to universal emancipation throughout the Danish West Indies constitutes one of the most significant events in Caribbean and New World history. And I don't think we appreciate that. Uh, this is a place where enslaved people freed themselves and they did so peacefully, unlike in Haiti, the only other place where people freed themselves, which led to uh, civil wars and revolutionary upheavals and so on that have had an enormous impact on the development of that country ever since. Here, it was peaceful. There were some violence, there were some people died, but by and large, emancipation was achieved without open warfare. And that is something to be said about the people of the Virgin Islands too. In my opinion, as an educator, emancipation should first and foremost be recognized as being achieved by the collective action of thousands of Crusians and not the achievement of a few individuals like Peter von Schulten or the man called Buddo. I take that very seriously. I think social change is brought about by people working together to achieve a common end. And if there are not a, lot, a mass of people involved, then social change becomes harder and harder to achieve. So my point of view of emancipation is not just about the leaders, Buddo, von Schulten, which is generally the approach that Virgin Islands historians take, but I want to look at the people who have who were involved in the insurrection, who made it happen, and who who were they, and how did they achieve what happened, or how did they achieve results? Let me just review the main events because this is the framework in which uh, emancipation occurred. On July second, uh, after several months of organizing on the night of July 2nd, I should say, after several months of organizing, people from the West End and the middle part of the island of St. Croix began assembling for the purpose of marching to Frederickstead in the morning to demand their freedom. On the morning of July 3rd, several thousand people, it's been estimated as many as 8,000 people, gathered in Frederickstead and surrounded Fort Frederick and told the authorities, and I'm simplifying a lot of events here, but they told the, they told the authorities that they wanted universal emancipation or they would burn the town down. Authorities informed them that only von Schulten could make that decision. And a message was sent to the governor to get his concurrence or to do something one way or the other. The insurgents wait, waited more or less peacefully until 4 p.m. that afternoon. That's practically 10 hours of relative peace. They did, in fact, burn down a store uh, of a man who urged the um, soldiers to fire on them. The insurgents also broke into the police office and did some and uh, destroyed that building and unfortunately the archives inside of it. But there were no lives lost and by and large that 10 or 12 hours 
pass by relatively peacefully. Many people are at four o'clock, von Scholten arrives after much dithering on the subject. Uh, he couldn't make up his mind what he wanted to do and finally decided he would go to Frederickstead in order to uh, make the proclamation of freedom. He arrives around four o'clock and he declared people free. And at that point, people began to disperse and to spread the word throughout the countryside that freedom had come at last. Now, that evening, it, it starts getting a little more unsettled after that. That evening, a crowd of people from, and this is the evening of the third and the morning of the fourth at night, people from the north side of states gathered and started to head to Christiansted. Their purpose is not known, but they are perceived by the authorities as a threat. And against von Schulten's orders, they are fired upon at Basin Triangle, and several are killed or wounded. These are the first casualties of the emancipation uprising. And they have a very profound effect because suddenly people are being shot down and nobody understands why. And word spreads throughout the island about these, uh, these uh, people being killed. There was another incident a few hours later uh, and on the contentment road where other people were killed. So there are several casualties on that evening and that creates unrest throughout the island because nobody quite knows now what is going to happen next. July 4 through 6 are days of both celebration and unrest on estates throughout the island. And this is well documented in many accounts. Um, but by and large, people are peaceful. They are destroying uh, some property, some uh, overseer houses, manager houses. They break into some great houses, but they are not doing outright violence to anybody. Many agricultural estate workers are arrested and jailed during the 4th and the 6th by the free colored militia. The regular troops are kept in the two towns in order to prevent the citizens there. And many of the, the white population assemble in those towns because of what is the unrest that's going on in the countryside. On the 7th of July, Spanish troops arrive from Puerto Rico and Danish troops are sent into the countryside. There's a regular court martial established in Frederickstead and two people are convicted and executed on the 7th. Later on that day, von Schulten resigned out of fatigue and I think distress and a few days later, he sailed for Denmark, leaving the uh, governor of St. Thomas, uh, Oxholm, who is a property owner and a former slave owner, in charge. <clears throat> On July 10th, court marshals are a court martial is established in Christiansted. I'm sorry, court martial was established in. Frederickstead, and two people were executed. This is on the 7th. Uh, on the 10th, seven more people were executed. And a court martial is established in Christiansted, and over the next few days, eight more people are executed. So there are 17 people at least who we know died during the insurrection. But after the, by the 10th, the unrest in the countryside had been uh, stopped. People were free, but nobody 
understood exactly what that meant. And of course, in the aftermath, uh, you have laws that were passed, the Labor Act, Act and a number of other acts that virtually restored slavery, uh, forcing people to stay on their plantations that they worked and giving them very little freedom or privilege. Now, I'd like to discuss why this, these events may have happened the way they did. First of all, it is somewhat incredible that the enslaved population felt that if they went to Fredericksted and demanded their freedom against the threat of fire, they would be freed. And I think in the history of the islands, there are reasons for that assumption that, that it would work. First of all, in the 1830s, there were a series of fires throughout St. Croix on the plantations. And because of those fires, which posed serious threats to the economy and to the property of the planter class, very strong laws were passed against fire. Anybody involved in fires uh, was, would be arrested. There have to be determination whether that was accidental, deliberate, and so on. And the police records contain many, many instances of that happening. So the enslaved population knew that fire was a serious threat and that the fire was going, would destroy Fredericksted, certainly. And the people who, the enslaved people who were behind the fire threat were women. The women had gathered um, wood and placed it around the fort and in Fredericksted, even before uh, the morning of July 3rd. And they were prepared to use that and they told the authorities so. So something in the spirit of protest over the last 20 or 30 years beforehand had convinced people that the threat of fire would be enough to coerce the authorities to declaring freedom. Now, one other thing has to be taken into account here, and that is the timing of this. There were many things that were going on uh, in the background, uh, one of which was that the well, first of all, von Schulten in, in 1747, I'm sorry, 1847 had, well, I'm going to back up even further. The King of Denmark, not von Schulten, in 1847 had declared that the children under 12 would be free from that date on. That was, I believe, June of 1847. So after that date, enslaved children under 12 years of age were free. Their parents were not. Now the parents would become free according to the same decree in 12 years. Well, in 12 years, at the rate of attrition, and it was very high in those days of, of people surviving slavery, most people could calculate that they weren't going to be alive. So I think those combined decisions by the King of Denmark was a precipitation for the planning and the execution of the uprising. There were also events in the French West Indies where the enslaved population was also emancipated. And again, there were uprisings and so on, but they were much more violent than those that happened in St. Croix. And they happened to some extent after emancipation, not because of emancipation. Now, how do we treat this? 
as educators. As I say, uh, this is a popular movement, emancipation. It's something that is done by the people of the island, not by the authorities, as portrayed by most of the Danish work. Von Schulten did not make Mon Von Schulten did not make emancipation happen. He only declared emancipation, and he did so under threat of violence. Now, educators should contextualize this event, I think, and visual and, and approach it as part of the democratic movement against royalism and social injustice that began with the American, French, and Haitian revolutions. We need to recognize that this was part of something bigger than St. Croix. And we also need to document and tell the story from the bottom up, not from the top down, because this is what uh, did occur. Now, let me, I have a list of publications that I think would help you all as educators uh, get a better handle on what took place in emancipation, in the Emancipation Rebellion, and uh, why it happened. I have a list of those which I will share with uh, Stephanie Brown, and which I hope might be reprinted because they're in publications that are not uh, commonly uh, available any longer, but they could be reprinted and made available both to educators and students, but also to the general public, because these are important uh, historical uh, descriptions and analysis that everybody should be aware of, because they shed a somewhat different light on emancipation than we usually have. Uh, I'm going to shift now to my last point, and this is about uh, my role, this is because of my role as a preservationist. And I want to identify emancipation places that still survive. Buildings and places can be used to tell the stories of the people who live there, which is one of the main reasons they deserve preservation. There are many places on St. Croix from 1848 that can be used to tell the story of emancipation and to recognize and celebrate organizers and martyrs of that event. And I know we can talk about that, uh, that statement a little further, but I want to identify some of those. And first and foremost, of course, is Fort Frederick and what is today Emancipation Garden. That is the place where emancipation uh, occurred. And that is the place which contains the statue of Butto and is a place of recognition already. It is a monument to the event itself. Then there's the town of Frederickstead. The whole town was involved in the emancipation uprising. Uh, a few buildings were destroyed, but most of the town survived until 1878 when the built, most of those buildings were burnt down. But Frederickstead as a town is a place where emancipation can be and is celebrated on a regular basis. Third, there's the Bowson Triangle, where people were massacred by the militia on the night of January 3rd and the morning of January 4th. This is the first place, as I said before, where people who were celebrating 
their freedom were killed. It is an event and it needs to be commemorated. We don't recognize it really at all in our celebrations, but I believe strongly that we need to do so henceforth. Fourth, there is the Richmond prison. Now this not, may not seem like a place for emancipation celebration, but there are two factors here. One, 100 to 100, 200 people were in prison for months in Richmond prison. It is a place where people who were convicted or thought to be guilty of crimes were put. It is also a place where Butto was held even before the emancipation on several occasions. I think it was a place where people could talk among themselves, people who were dissenters, who resisted enslavement, who for one reason or another fell afoul of the law. It was a place where people could meet other people of like minds and where they could begin talking about social change. So I would nominate Richmond Prison as another place. And then there are the plantations. Events between January, J July 3rd and July 8th affected about every plantation west of Fred Christian said. The courageous people who assembled in Frederickstead and won general, general emancipation came from these properties. Most of these estates experienced some unrest in the two or three days after emancipation was declared. But today there are standing ruins, including village sites of these historic sites, which can be used to tell the story of emancipation. And I think we should take advantage to do so. Most prominent among them are, and I'm going to just name names and why they have some, some uh, importance in the emancipation story. Estate LaGrange, which is just outside of Frederickstead, who was the home of Butto, who was the home of Benjamin, who was killed during the emancipation uprising. And Butto, of course, was an organizer. It was also the place where people assembled before the night of the third, before they went into Frederickstead on that morning. A state Butler Bay, North Side A quarter, where three organizers of the Emancipation Rebellion uh, were enslaved. State of Bog of Allen, or Allendale in Prince Quarter, where Martin King, one of the organizers of the insurrection, lived. The state Hams Bay, North Side A quarter, where Martin Williams, another organizer, was enslaved. The state Mount Pleasant in Prince Quarter, where Frederick, AKA Bongo, as he was called, an organizer, lived. The state Concordia in West End quarter, where Augustus, an organizer and one of the first executed martyrs lived. And when I say martyrs, these are people who died during the insurrection. Most of them were killed unjustly, I think. They were killed either in the firing of in, in Christiansted at Bazan Triangle, or they were executed by a uh, court martial. And there were 17 individuals executed overall by court martial. And these people died for freedom and they deserve being recognized. The state Manning's Bay, Big Robert, who was an executed martyr. The state Lower Bethlehem, or Bethlehem as we call it, in the middle part of the island. Decatur died. He was an executed martyr. State Castle Burke, who died on, uh, an, who who died during the rebellion, who was ex or during after, I'm sorry, I've got this confused. He died. He was another executed martyr. State Good Hope Martin, 
an executed martyr. And I was involved in writing up a biography of Martin and his family, uh, which is the Peterson family uh, of Good Hope uh, in a, an exhibit that was done at WIM. Some of you may have seen that uh, five or six years ago in which we recognize the people who were executed and the people who participated, it, who were arrested and executed uh, in the, in the um, aftermath of the rebellion. The state Golden Grove, Matei Metabius, who was an executed martyr, and he was one, the only African uh, born in Africa who I can determine was <clears throat> involved in the insurrection. And of course, that was because most Africans were very old by 1848. Slave trade had ended in 1803. Uh, a few people came later, but that was almost 50 years, 45 years earlier when the last African um, came directly from Africa. The state Rose Hill, Adam, who was a martyr. The state Big Fountain, John Simmons, who was executed martyr. The state Enfield Green, James Heiliger, executed martyr. The state Lorraine, Henry, who was a martyr, executed martyr. And Joe, who died, who could be considered during the insurrection, a martyr. Charlie, who died of uh, Cyan Farm, where Charlie died, he was a martyr. Peter's Rest, Benjamin, he died as a martyr of the revolution. Estate Montbijou, George, he died as a martyr of the revolution. Estate Spanish Town, Thomas, died as a martyr of the revolution. Estate Canaan, Samuel Eprahim, who died as a martyr of the revolution in prison. The state Lebanon Hill, Thomas, who died as a martyr. The state Diamond, Stephanus, who died as a martyr. A martyr. And the state Coakley Bay, where Josephine, the only woman who, was, who died during the rebellion that we know of, who was uh, a martyr wounded during the night of July 3rd, the morning of July 4th. A state Castle Coakley, I'm going to come back to women in a minute. The state Cast Castle Coakley, Jesse, who was a martyr. Thomas, at the state Baron Spot, was a martyr. And the state Jerusalem, George, who was a martyr. The state Work and Rest, Andreas, who died from his wounds, a martyr. And the state Belvedere, Johann Thomas, who died as a martyr. Now I call their names because I wanted to put them on the record beside the names of Butto and Martin King and a few others. I mentioned women and, well, let me come back to that in a moment. Maybe we can talk about that afterwards because I want to suggest right now that one important thing we should collectively accomplish this year of a celebration is the creation of an emancipation trail with signage and information stations. Such a trail would enhance community education, education in our schools, promote our tourism product, and make a significant contribution to the new St. Croix National Heritage Area. Uh, that would be a lasting contribution and a fitting contribution because it's a recognition of the people who organized and gave their lives to the freedom of their brothers and sisters on St. Croix. And they uh, deserve some kind of recognition um, and I think an emancipation trail would do that. Finally, and I know this is somewhat controversial stuff, but I'll throw that out anyway, uh, the women. Uh, the first woman who comes to mind is Anna Higo. She has been celebrated in some books 
as someone who persuaded von Schulten to free the slaves. Uh, I am not of that persuasion. Von Schulten, or Anna Higor, was, as a, an adult, a slave owner. I have documented that she owned at least 32 or 33 slaves during her lifetime. She not only was a slave owner, but she was a slave trader. She bought and sold most of the slaves that she owned. The fact that she did so was significant in acquiring a great deal of wealth that went to the um, construction of Bulis Mende, where she and von Scholten lived. And by the way, that should be another place that should be on the heritage trail because of von Scholten's connection. But I don't have, I don't think that Anna Higor deserves recognition as a heroine of emancipation. That's my personal opinion, but there are good reasons for doing that. Um, in terms of women's contribution to the uprising, they were present from the outset. They were there in Frederickstead, among the crowd of six to 8,000 people. They were involved in the unrest that happened after emancipation. And while they are not named individually because they were not, only a few of them were even brought to trial, um, it is important to recognize that women played a role equal to the men maybe even more so in terms of numbers to emancipation in 1848. I'm going to stop here. I've thrown out some things to you uh, and I would like to hear some questions and we can have some discussion. Thank you.